that night, what I didn't see was a trip wire stretched across the road. And when my front tires hit it, it detonated a roadside bomb large enough that when it hit my door, it threw this 9,000 pound armored Humvee flying through the air and landed in the canal running adjacent to the road. Hi, and welcome to Common Denominator, where we shine a light on people striving to make the world a better place. Today, Purple Heart recipient and military hero, Noah Galloway. So I just finished my conversation with Noah and what really struck a chord for me, which I ask all guests is what they're grateful for. What he answered me was his injury. In 2005, Noah lost a part of his left leg and a part of his left arm in Operation Iraqi Freedom. In the interview, when I asked him what is something he's grateful for, he mentioned his injury as the thing that stuck out in his mind, which created his whole framework for his life. I believe that most people that would have those type of injuries, it would definitely affect them the other way. So when you hear the interview, I hope you're as blown away by his optimism and gratitude as much as I was. Before we play my chat with Noah, a quick reminder that if you like the show, please subscribe and follow me on social media at mpopak. Now, here's my conversation with Noah Galloway. Enjoy. Hi, Noah. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Thanks for having me on your show. Yes. Welcome to Common Denominator. It's really great to have you. Uh, you know, everybody has what's their core and what speaks, speaks to them. And I know for you, and it definitely rings a bell within me, it's no excuses. Mm -hmm. Tell us about why that that idea is so important to you and a place even throughout your charity and everything that you do. Why is that so important? Well, I mean, it, the best way to describe it is to really give you a little bit of the history. I joined the military because of September 11th and ended up in college in my first semester when, well, my first, I take that back. You know, my first year was in 2001. And so I was in college when 9-11 happened. And when that happened, I felt motivated to do something. And I, I wanted to do my part. And I joined the military and ended up in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And I went back on my second deployment and was severely injured and lost my left arm and left leg. And there were other injuries that were involved. But to be a physical person and then wake up one day and two of my limbs were gone, I really battled with that. And we can go more into detail of that later. But as I started to recover, uh, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, and get back to taking care of myself, I got back into fitness and doing things. And because I started challenging myself, missing arm and leg, people just, they said I took their excuses away. So then that that mantra of no excuses, and I wrote a book, Living With No Excuses, because you know, it's true. We all can come up with an excuse for anything, but it's wanting to overcome that and achieve something greater is what I'm always trying to do and I always trying to motivate others to do. It always um, seems that that the way like the human psyche is set up is you create this kind of purpose, this why. And I think that it seems that that no excuses is the thing like your lifelong journey, like the thing. That, yes. Right. That's well, you know, I, you know, I'm just like everyone else. You have those moments of self doubt, you know, and we have that part of us that is always telling us, no, that doesn't work or no, you're not good enough. You know, I'm no different than anyone else, but I had a thought the other day that I, I shared with my wife that sounded arrogant, but it was something good for me. Cause as a, you know, I'm a guy that is always like, I wonder if I've really proven myself. You know, I wonder if I'm if I'm challenging myself enough. And I told my wife, I realized, oh my God, I have pushed myself to every limit since I've been injured. In fact, me pushing myself has gained attention for doing those things. So I have this this huge pride in what I've accomplished. But what I'm most proud of is the reaction that I've gotten from other people. The amount of people that reach out to me that say that I've taken their excuses away or motivated them to just live a healthier life. I feel like that is one of my main purposes in life. You know, my children, my family are my priority, and I try to live a healthy life for them. And that is just a ripple effect that everyone that comes in contact with us, we try to just motivate to be healthier, happier, um, big into mental health. And I feel like I, I try to 
show that example as best I can, even with my own, you know, um, limits and self doubt that I have just like everyone else. And so, so you're, I just want to go back to this for a second. So when, so you're in, so you're in Iraq, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to the actual incident, um, and what is, what does the scene look like? What was, what was the, so, so this was 2005 in Iraq. We were in Southwest Baghdad, an area known as the triangle of death. It was an area that every unit that had been there had taken a beating. We were no different. Uh, there's a book that was written about us called uh, Black Hearts, One Platoon's Demise in the Triangle of Death. A picture of my Humvee is in the book. It's just a, it's a tough read. Um, but we just, it was, a, it was a rough deployment. So where we were, we were, we didn't have enough man- manpower for what we were doing. There was a lot of leadership mistakes that happened. Well, anyway, we're in this area. And one platoon, about 30 guys, we had to run two missions. Half the group went in one direction. My group went the other. The group I was with, we finished what we were doing first. We searched some buildings, whatever. We went back. We're living out of an old potato factory. I laid down because, you know, you get a chance to sleep, you take it. We didn't live on a camp. We lived with the locals. And just as I dozed off, my platoon leader, Lieutenant Edson, woke me up and said, hey, Galloway, we got to take the Humvees to go pick up the rest of the hum- the rest of the platoon. There's nothing important going on. We're just going and coming back. I just wanted you to know. Mm. And I got up, insisted that I go and drive the lead vehicle. So we left at about two o'clock in the morning. And in Iraq in 2005, you would drive with your headlights off, off and your night vision goggles on. And with night vision goggles, you can see well, but you can't see everything. It does distract the enemy from picking up your detection on the road. But that night, what I didn't see was a tripwire stretch across the road. And when my front tires hit it, it detonated a roadside bomb large enough that when it hit my door, it threw this 9,000-pound armored Humvee flying through the air and landed in a canal running adjacent to the road. Thankfully, it landed wheels down. My buddy said the water was up to my chest. had a huge hole in my jaw. My arm was already taken off. My legs were tangled up in the wreckage. They struggled to get me up the embankment, into a vehicle, rushed me back to the potato factory. Medics worked on me. Helicopter picked me up, took me to a camp in Baghdad. Baghdad to Germany. Germany to Wall Street Army Medical Center in D.C. And that's when I woke up. Six days after the incident on Christmas Day, I woke up as my family was coming in. And it was it was a lot. I know I'm rambling, but it was a lot that I took on at one mm-hmm. time. And for me, like, yeah, you know, I've had a lot of great accomplishments but in those moments i was terrified i was scared i one minute i was arrogant like this will be fine the next minute i was angry moments after that i was crying like a baby i didn't know what i was going to do with my life and that's that's kind of how i sat for a while and entered my depression was just scared so after the incident is that is that kind of like the the headspace is kind of like you were in kind of a dark space um, I was. So when I was in the hospital, it was, it was, it became very difficult. I, once I got through with all my surgeries, the surgeries were one after the other. And I was on so much pain medicine. There was a couple of times. I remember the first time it happened, the nurses gave me, or the anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist was gave me something to go to sleep for surgery. And I wouldn't go to sleep because I'd had so much medicine in my system. Mm. And I overheard them say he's not going to sleep. And one of the nurses said he'll have to go in awake. And I was like, oh, no. And that these emotions were just back and forth. And even when I left the hospital, I wasn't comfortable with who I was. You know, I I loved being – I found myself in the military. But when I got there, I found that I loved it. That was taken away. I was always physical in every job I had. I felt like I'd never be physical again. And I was I, – I struggled and was scared. I moved back to Alabama. Uh, I'd already been married once, got a divorce, rushed into a second marriage, had two more children. So then suddenly I was divorced for a second time with three kids, my injury, no idea what I was going to do. And it was actually my children that were the motivation to say, well, now I've got to do something because this isn't just affecting me. This is affecting my children. You know, I'm, 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 teaching lessons, you know, I've, you know, in time you learn as a parent, you can talk to your children to your blue in the face. They learn from what we do. And I was not a good person in the beginning of my struggles. 
So it was a couple and, years. So in other words, it was a couple years and you're sitting there and you look at your kids and you're like, you know what? That was kind of like your moment. I got to get my act yeah. together. So what was your, what was your process mentally, physically to begin that so recovery? What, so what the big moment that I had was walking into the living room and the kids were watching cartoons one morning. And I realized to my two boys, I'm showing them what a man is and that's what they're going to become one day. And to my little girl, I'm showing her how a man's supposed to act. So that became my motivation because the person I was, what anybody wanted my boys to be or my daughter to look for. So I knew I had to make a change. But I always tell people that life is not a movie. Things don't just fix. I still screwed up. I still made mistakes. But every time I screwed up and fell flat on my face, it was a thought of my kids that motivated me to get it. I, I, I'm not afraid to admit I spent 10 days in the county jail during this process. You know, I screwed up. I made a judge mad, got contempt of court. He threw me in the county. Like things like that were happening. And I was terrified that I was going to screw my kids up. So it became this slow process of changing the way I was eating, changing the people I was spending time with, and then slowly started feeling better, exercising and, and moving past that. And just trying to be the best father I can be. And now here it is. I'm, you know, my children are not toddlers anymore. They're 18, 15, 13. And now I have a five month old. So I feel like, you know, my kids are my life and I just keep starting over. <laughs> I know mental health awareness is super important to you, but just as practical tools, what I was reading about is you talk about eating more whole foods, right? Mm -hmm. Eating better. And then actual physical fitness, right? Yeah. Those are things that could directly. Oh my uh, God. Uh, mitigate, People have no idea. Right. They have no idea what it does for you mentally. Like there's still, you know, counseling, therapy, things like that are necessary depending on your situation. But the, what it does for your mental health when you take care of your body. You know, because, you know, it's, it's hard to explain to people, but it's that, that old saying, you are what you eat. And it's hard to get that through to people. You're, what you eat affects you within 24 hours, you know, mm -hmm. and it can affect you, you know, your physical body and your mental. And that is so critical. I know, I know you, t you know, to the extent where you became a personal trainer, right? So you yeah. were, so you're, you're working out, you're feeling great. And what motivated you as the next step to become a personal trainer. Well, I always enjoyed fitness. I got into fitness at a young age and obsessed over it. And that was actually a huge advantage when I got injured, when I got back into shape, because there's no literature out there that could tell me how to work out missing arm and leg. So then suddenly it was like I was 12 years old again, sneaking into the fitness center at our local community center and teaching myself how to work out. So then I figured out how to use kettlebells and machines ankle straps on cable machines to work my chest, my shoulder, my back on my left side. And as I started doing that, I started gaining attention to, from people in the gyms. You know, I'd work out at one gym, then I'd move to another. And all the time I would have people come up to me and say, I'm here because I knew you would be here. I had people that said that what got them up in the morning was knowing that if the guy missing an arm and a leg is going to be at the gym, then they can be at the gym. And I take that as a huge compliment to know that I have motivated someone else because we all have those moments where you have that, man, I still feel like it today. And we all need that extra ump. And to know that I have been that for someone somewhere. Oh man, there's no better feeling in the world. And super impressed. You know, you also competed in, in fitness competitions. That's, yeah. Uh, oh, I did everything from yeah. marathons, off course races, mountain climbing, basically anything that people said, I, you know, they didn't think someone missing arm and leg could or should do. I wanted, and I went after it. Uh, a cover of Men's Health Magazine as well. Yeah, right. world's largest men's magazine. I was the first amputee and veteran, and they called me the ultimate guy. I love bragging about that. I've got a ton of those issues. <laughs> and how was that um, competing on Dancing with the Stars? How was that journey? Oh, my God. That was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like dancing. I don't know how to dance. When they reached out to me, I'd already turned down Survivor and another show. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually knew Survivor. I didn't even know what Dancing with the Stars was. But Survivor, mm -hmm. the problem was there's no contact back home. Even when those people get voted off during the show, they stay with the crew. There's no contact back home. They keep everything secret. So I turned it down because of my kids. And then Dancing with the Stars called and said they'd put me in a house 
in LA for the duration of the time I was there. And I said, I can't do it. My kids here in Alabama are more important. And they said, that's all right. They sent the dancer to Birmingham. We rehearsed in our dance studio here and flew back and forth to LA for the live show. And I didn't think I'd last very long, thought maybe two weeks. I ended up doing the entire 10 weeks, came in third place. In fact, I don't, I mean, when I, after the show aired, I had the two most viewed dances in the history of Dance with the Stars. Now it's been five, six years, so I don't know if I still do. But at the time, I did. Do you, at this point, do you enjoy dancing? I never danced. Uh, well, you know, here's what's funny. I'll share a funny story with you. I was at a wedding a couple of months after I was on Dance with the Stars. And this, this old woman came up to me and said she loved me on Dance with the Stars. And I'm at this wedding because I heard you were going to be here, and I'm not leaving till I get a dance. And I said, <laughs> ma'am, I, I don't dance. And then a couple of, like an hour later, she said, I have to leave soon, but I'm not leaving until I get a dance. And I said, ma'am, I don't dance. Well, then another hour later, I had enough shots of tequila. I danced with every old woman in the place. And <laughs> I guess that was the last time I danced. I was like, I'm it. I'm done. Then The show was one of those things I'm glad I did, but I've had just the other day someone asked me if I learned anything. It is a crash course in a dance that you do for a minute and a half with one dancer. I didn't learn nothing about dance. And I'm fine with that. It was a fun show to do, but it I, think, was, it was I, I think that's amazing. That definitely inspires me. We took uh, my wife and I. We took some some dance classes for a little yeah. bit of time. Now I gotta now I gotta get back. They say uh, as you get older, it keeps you younger. By the way, dance. You know, I've got yeah. a uh, who is uh, he's in his sixties. Him and his wife take dance lessons, and me and my wife have talked about because I didn't learn anything. And I told her I would actually like to go and actually learn how to dance. I think that would be fun. You should get back into it. Y'all should do it. And uh, and I know you give back. You have your charity, right? The No Excuses yep. uh, Charitable Fund. Uh, tell yep. us about the things that are important uh, for the charity. So I started that charity because as an injured veteran, especially as a visibly injured veteran, I, I got to know a lot of different veteran organizations. And there's a lot of great ones out there. But unfortunately, you do find out that there's a lot of organizations, veterans or not, that – aren't as good as they claim to be. And that's why we have great mm. website, watchdog websites that you can check that. Most of your average person doesn't have time to research all these organizations. So they kind of get caught up in things. Well, I started my charitable fund to put focus on organizations that I know are doing the right thing. You know, there's a board of directors that I say, hey, I want the money to go to X, Y, Z. They approve it and it goes. You know, we have Sheepdog Impact Assistance out of Arkansas that works with veterans and first responders, Homes for Our Troops out of Boston that build homes for injured veterans. And then also, I'm in the YMCA right now. My local YMCA, I donate to the youth programs here. I'm here at the Y right now because not only do I work out here, but when we get off this podcast, I'm their backup bus driver for the after-school care. Hmm. So it's awesome because they love it because I'm either in L.A. doing something ridiculous or I'm here driving the after-school bus to the school to pick up the kids for after-school care. Because I believe that my community has been has taken care of me since I was injured. This community has always, everywhere I've gone, small community, everybody's been good to me. And all I want to do is make sure that I give back. And one, the reason I give back to the WISE youth programs is because fitness and being active is what helped me deal with my injury and my depression and we don't know which one of these children are going to need that and may reflect back on, you know, the health they learned while in the Y. So if, if one kid benefits from me donating to the Y, well, then it's been worth every penny. And, I, and, I, and of course, I remind people all the time, anytime we give, we always feel this. There's something magical about when we give. It's so much better when we, than when we receive because there's this, you feel it. You feel it when you give to somebody. And I'd love to take credit as being an amazing person, but the reality is I like feeling good and I feel good when I give to others. And especially when I give to others that have given so much to me. That seems to be a common thread through your life. Uh, you know, when you were saying before September 11 motivated you kind of, kind of give back, join the military. Yeah. Where'd that spark come from? I'm just trying my to family. see. Yeah. I, you know, without, a, yeah. without a doubt. So my family, Especially uh, my mom's side, my mom's side of the family, they're all either majority of people are either military 
or educators. Mm -hmm. And two of my sisters, right? One has her doctorate in education. The other was a special ed teacher. My mom retired from the board of education. I'm in the process of filling out the paperwork to be a substitute teacher because I do a lot of work with superintendents and all these different teachers. And I love, you know, I think because of my background, the military and educators, we're all servants. That is what our job is. You know, so you have, that's where my personality comes from. All we want to do is, is mm -hmm. take care of others. And so, you know, sometimes that's different. You know, I got to be a person to take care of others and carry a gun a long time ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's different ways of looking at it. My brother-in-law retired as a police officer. He he is a servant. You know what I mean? And that's where the beauty of it comes from is I have that in me and I want to pass that on to my children. And I know you wrote a memoir, No Excuse to the Remarkable, Remarkable Rebirth of an American Soldier. I did. What is one or two things that kind of stick out from the book um, what, that, really, stick, that well, really speak to you? What I'm proud of in that book, that book was was hard to do. I, I, I hired a good friend of mine to help me write it, uh, Rebecca Bayer, and she did an amazing job. And we, we spent several months going over what stories were going to be in the book. And I told her when we put the book together, I was like, you know, I want. I asked her to help me brutally be honest about my struggles and depression in that book. I mean, there's a lot of good things. You know, there's my childhood. There's Dancing with the Stars. There's funny things in it, but the meat of the book, I talk openly and honest about my struggles and my depression. And like I said, I spent ten days in the county jail. There's an entire chapter dedicated to that, and I'm not. I'm not um, proud of it, but it's a part of me that I had to share. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the book came out. It's been about a couple of years now, but I remember being terrified that people were going to judge me and not like me, but the response has been great. People, they see my honesty and truth come out and that's all I wanted to share. And I've had people that reach out to me, not just veterans, not just people that have disabilities, but those who have struggled or those who have known someone who has battled with depression. And that, that has been great, but I'm really, I'm really proud of that book because it was, it was hard to do but it was one of those things that, you know, afterwards you're like, man, I'm glad, I'm glad I put it out there. Yeah. I find people's like, oh, who's going to read that book? Who's going to do that? But it actually, for everyone's individual journey, even if you don't even publish it, but I do recommend it, uh, you know, I, I myself going through that and I think about it, it's just a, it's so a, a means of healing, you know, and they yes. say that the, the truth shall set you free. You put oh, everything man, you know, the way I, it is, right? When I get you know, doing your podcast or when I get a chance to go give a speech or when I, when I have random people walk, walk up to me and say, I hate to be rude. Do you mind me asking? I'm always like, no, please. Because when I do get a chance to share, it is. It is healing. It is healing me every time I get to share my story. And that's, you know, and I, I love what you said in the beginning. You were like, you know, everyone has a story and you're right. I always tell people that yeah. when they're like, oh, you have such an amazing story. I was like, no, I tell it well. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's, you know, I got that from my dad. My dad's a good storyteller. I'm a good storyteller. We all have a story to tell. It's just some of us are better at telling it. And there's nothing wrong with that. For me per personally, what also inspires me is how much of a, of a family, family man you are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's just really nice to see uh, how much you Thank love you. your kids and, uh, and the rest of your family. So it, it really... I do. You know, I... Yeah. You know, I mentioned in the beginning of my kids are now, I have teenagers and then a five month old. I got remarried and had another baby. And I told my older children, I said, you know, I will be a better father to your little brother because I'm older, I'm wiser. You know, not that I was a horrible parent when they were little, but I made mistakes. I wasn't perfect, you know, and I regret a lot of things, but me and the kids have, have, are really close. I have custody of all my children and we spend a lot of time together and we're a very close knit family. But, you know, it's one of those things that I have stressed to my children, wait to have children because I've had my friends who are now becoming grandparents are like, what's it like starting over 42? I have a four, five month old baby. I'm like, you know what? It's amazing. I, I'm more in tune to my children and I feel like for a small infant, I'm better as a parent because I have more patience. And so I try to encourage my kids to take their time and enjoy life and then start the family life because family life is terrifying. Like I, I, I am not afraid to admit I have two ex-wives. That's not anything you want to be proud of, but you know what? I was young, rushed into first marriage, you know, rushed into a second. And it took me being single and figuring out who I was 
sure. before I could find the woman that was meant for me. And I feel like a lot of us, when it comes to mental health, I remind people, I was reminding my wife, who is very much aware of it, but we always have to spot check each other to take care of yourself, just like her and the baby. I'm like, if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of him. Don't let yourself go taking care of him. We have to start here. And it it shows because if we can't take care of, I, you know, when I meet people, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but I just thought of like when people smoke, you know, you don't see it as often, but when you see someone smoke and there's that argument, you have to die of something. We've all heard that, right? Yeah. Well, the way I turn that around, I say, what if you don't die immediately? What if you put yourself in such horrible shape that your children have to stop what they're doing in life and take care of you? That usually stops people in their tracks. Nobody wants to be a burden to someone else, but we don't think about what we're doing to ourselves when we eat that that processed food, when we don't stay active, we don't go for walks or do anything. We are not only tearing ourselves up, we're not doing anything good for our families and those that love us and we love. What would you say uh, for someone that sustained similar injuries to yours or is just down on their luck? Uh, what piece of advice would you say for someone to just snap out of that and begin their journey? Um, I would say number one, therapy, go ahead and get you a counselor, get enrolled in mental health. Slowly start. I say this to people, whether they're injured or not, when it comes to fitness, I always remind people, Hey, look, you know, if you took 20 years to get like this, it ain't going to go away in 20 days, but you know, you have to make small, small changes. Slowly change the way you're eating. Cut back on the soda. Start drinking more water. Slowly ease into the gym. Because too often people try to do everything at once and they crash and burn. They try to make too big of a diet. They try to take on too big of a workout plan. You have to ease into it. And there's actually a, a, a gentleman three hours north of me in Nashville that I'd met years ago. And we're going to play golf in like two weeks. He lost his arm and leg in a motorcycle accident. His mom put us in contact. And we've been friends ever since. I've gone to Nashville and showed him ways to work out. But he called me the other day and he was like, or he texted me. I felt I needed to call him. He texted and said, hey, since your depression, does it ever come back? I knew where he was going with it. I immediately called him. And I said, brother, listen, yeah, I, I talk about and share in my book that I went through depression, but I didn't ever say it ended. I still go through it. I still have moments like I usually the winter time is the worst for me and I'm in the process of coming out I make sure and go to counseling and have someone to talk to because we all go through it sometimes more than others and I reminded him that there's nothing wrong with that whether you're missing arm and leg or not we as humans this brain is complicated and our world is constantly evolving and changing and we're constantly trying to keep up with it and it's hard on us you know because basically we're just animals trying to create and survive hmm. And, you know, and those challenges can be detrimental to our mental health and that mental health affects the rest of our body. So there's nothing wrong with having someone you go and talk to and work through. And, you know, I'm in the world of really my wife has introduced me to the world of holistic living. You know, that's where people who are trying to prevent instead of waiting for something to happen and then and taking care of that pain with medication. So it's been really interesting, the world that I have ventured into with my wife, who's a yoga instructor and holistic, and I'm just a guy who likes to pick up heavy things and and show off doing crazy races. So it's this world that's merged. It's been really good, not just for my physical health, but my mental health. Yeah, I'm and I big, encourage people all the time. Sorry, yeah, to do just that. I'm a big believer in prevention um, in yeah. everything, right? Why 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 uh, allow something to happen and just to go ahead and try to fix it later? Yeah. Uh, what is something that you're grateful for? My family, my yeah. children, my wife, they are my kids. I mean, I'm living in a house with an 18 year old son, a seven, I mean, a 15 year old son, a 13 year old daughter, and then the five month old baby. And our house is my wife turned into this peaceful place. We all, we, sp we spend time together all the time. We communicate. I've got the kids in counseling. So that they can work through things that they've gone through and they're, you know, and they're, you know, well, middle school's hard, uh, you know, puberty's hard, all those things. And so I am very grateful for the life I have with my family. You know, I would, if I hadn't been, I loved the military and I was going to stay in until I retired. And I had all these plans, special forces, all this. But 
I wouldn't have had the, I wouldn't be the father I am today if I hadn't have been injured. If I hadn't been injured, hadn't gone through those struggles and depression, in no way would I be the father or the husband I am today. So that is what I'm grateful about. You know what? I'm grateful I got injured. As crazy as that is, mm. it 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 gave me a sense of purpose and resilience. And in my in my life, most people I meet that have a great attitude have a story of something horrible they lived through. Mm. I've got a friend that his business is working to help get people that are have been wrongfully I'm sorry wrongfully imprisoned out. You know what I mean? And these stories you hear of people that it happens all the time, and he has these. Then they work together when they finally get out, and I'm like, wow, what are these guys? He says they usually have the best attitudes, yeah, because they have struggled and they know what it's like to uh, be in the darkness and to appreciate the light. We get that idea of the biggest, a lot of, a lot of the guests on the show, when I ask that question, because it's a common question we ask, they do talk about their greatest struggles um, end up being the things that they're the most grateful for. It's yeah, actually oh, that's so funny. A, lot of, a lot of the guests, and I, whenever I hear it, it makes me smile. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, and I'm glad I, I answered it right. <laughs> uh, no, it's from your heart. It's from your heart. And what is yep. something about you that people don't know? Um, I bet there's a lot of things people don't know. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm an open book, um, but I... I fear, I, I don't ever think I get a chance, like those who don't meet me in person, social media, or if they've seen me on Dance with the Stars, I like to think, I'm, I'm a pretty goofy person. Like, I, I like to tell jokes. I like to be funny. And I don't think I get a chance to do that enough on TV. And I, don't, I always hate that people don't get to see that side of me because I think I'm hilarious. And I, I hate that people miss out on that. No, you definitely have an energy... Um... That type of, uh, you know, that, that type of light energy, you know, you're probably a kid at heart, you know, I, that's I the, am. That's yes. a sense oh, I that's like, yeah. something is so like me being yeah. like the backup bus driver for the, uh, after school care, it came about one, because I'm, I'm always here working out and I take the time to go by and I always, all the kids know me, you know what I mean? Cause I mean, I'm missing arm and leg. So first they see me, then they want to know who I am. And then once they know me, I go by and they all know me and I say hello to them it's because I love kids. You know, I come from a family of educators and that's just who we are. And so you're right. I am a kid at heart. So it's like, I want to, oh, just life is supposed to be enjoyed. And that's all I want to do. Well, I want to thank you so much, Noah. It's really been great and inspiring. And I want to wish you the best of luck. Uh, how can if people want to learn more about you, Noah? How can they do that? Well, I have my website, noahgalloway.com, and I'm also through that. You can find my social media. I have Instagram, Facebook, and they're both certified accounts if you if you pull them up. And, uh, yeah, they can follow me on there. And if you go to my website, I also, you know, I have a charity golf tournament every year, and there's just different things I like to get involved with, and I and I try to share that with uh, on my post. So, yeah, if anybody's interested, it's there. Thank you so much, Noah. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, it, was, it, it was a true pleasure. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Noah. Please subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode and follow me on social media at mpopak. Have a great day and I'll talk to you again soon.